Come on, can I get a worshiper to just wait in those waters just for one moment? We sung the songs that the worshiper wrote, but now let's sing our own song to God. Come on, give him the fruit of your lips. Come on, just begin to bless his name. Say something sweet to the king right now. Come on, let the atmosphere gain the incense of your worship. Come on, let, release some smoke up in the place. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, if you know he's here, let's acknowledge him like he's a king. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey. In this moment, God, you satisfy every desire that I would ever want. He is complete fulfillment. Contentment. We bless you and thank you for creating us like this. We were created to worship you. Thank you for making us like this. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for engineering our joy to be attached to our thank you. Thank you for tying our praise to, 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 to our strength. Thank you for making us like this. Oh, that men would praise the Lord. Whoa. Whoa. We bless you and we thank you even right now. In the name of Jesus, just clap your hands one good time. Hallelujah. 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 Hey, Rabba Shana God, we worship you. We bless your name, God. We must never forget that the enemy always attacks position. He knew if God took six days preparing the environment for Adam, if he was going to destroy Adam, he had to get him out of that environment. Make no mistake about it. He knew when Adam ate that fruit, he would lose the environment God created him to thrive in. Position is important. Amen. Position is important. And so the enemy many times plays a game of position with us. The reason why God asked Adam where he was was because when the enemy attacks, we don't realize how much he's moved us out of our position. Anybody ever came out of a trial and realized how far away that trial moved you from where you were before it started? And you realize I need to make my way back. I need to take back some stuff because the enemy's intention is to attack us and displace us without us realizing just how displaced we are. Because he understands our ability to thrive is based on stewarding the environment God created us to thrive in. Amen. Many times what the prophetic does, he does what God did to Adam. I believe that that was a prophetic essence. He said, Adam, where are you? I need you to recognize how out of position you become. I believe that this is a word to bring us back into a position for which God has called us as a church to thrive. What 
Marcus said was so profound as he was to sing, because I believe I, me and you were created to change the world. We were not only created to change the world geometrically, but we were created to change the world generationally. Our seed shall bruise the head of the serpent. I believe we are created to change the world ge geographically and generationally. Amen. And anything less than that is living outside of the privilege and promise God has for our lives. But in order to function in that level of influence and authority, it demands maintaining and stewarding the original position God put us in in order to thrive in that way. These signs shall follow them that believe. Amen. But that demands stewarding an environment. Stewarding a position that many times we don't realize we gave up. And so I believe this word is to call us back into a position, not just as individuals, but as a congregation. I, I want to deal with a congregational word since we have multiple uh, um, families in the house. And uh, glory be to God, I believe that it's only right that we deal congregationally. Amen. It's only right because we need to understand that we grow by the joints and the ligaments that all supply. Amen. We cannot grow up without each other. Period. Amen. We can grow, but it won't, we won't look like him. It's a whole bunch of folk growing, but it don't look like him. In order to look like him, we got to grow through the joints and ligaments that all supply. There has to be a commitment and submission to Christian community, congregation. That's why I love how God referred to Israel in the wilderness, the congregation of Israel. Amen. Bless the Lord. Because what it does is it delivers us from a lot of ideologies that are false. You know, everybody moves at their own pace. Everybody changes how they change. Some change like this and some. Not if you're a flock. How many flocks do you know where one sheep says, y'all go at this pace, but I'm going to go at that pace. If I'm a sheep going at a different pace, I'm not a part of that flock. We don't grow at our own pace. We go at the pace of the flock. So, so many, so many lies and heresies have creeped into the house of God because we have not properly examined the flock revelation. The congregational uh, re revelation. Amen. Bless the Lord. Sheep don't grow by themselves. Only wolves do. That's a whole nother message <laughs> for a whole nother day. <laughs> so let's deal with this congregational stuff. Exodus 33. Watch this. Exodus 33. Glory to God. Ain't it a beautiful thing to be able to look at your neighbor and see how God is changing them and know God can change you the same way right now. The day of Pentecost was the announcement that God does, brings us into public places to give us personal breakthroughs. Y'all know that, right? That's what Pentecost was all about. What happened to one happened to all. But they had to come together corporately to get what they needed personally. Everybody got a tongue. But if they wasn't in the house, they wasn't getting nothing. Corporate purposes have personal edification tied to them. That you can't get by yourself. You ain't getting no tongue of fire by yourself. That was a position. It was a place. Everybody say a place. It's called upper room. And I don't care if you walk with Jesus three and a half years. If you wasn't in the upper room. You wasn't getting that cloven tongue. I don't care if you saw every miracle. If you wasn't in position. You ain't getting it. So that's why COVID and this ideology is so irate at deceiving the weak. You know who the wolves are attacking? The sheep that were already straying. 
you was already tagging behind before this happened. So you're easy pick off because you wasn't coming every week to church to begin with. You got to keep up with the flock. I wish I could preach up in here. Why does the devil keep on attacking me? Because you a sheep acting like one of the wolves. The devil keeps attacking you because you ain't with everybody else. God, I, somebody shout congregational. There's certain things that won't attack you because of certain people you're around. The devil won't even try you. Anybody ever been in that time where... You were still dibbling and dabbling, not saying that that's the way God delivers us, but what? But when you were around certain people, that thing didn't really hit you hard, but waited till you got to yourself, and then you start struggling with it again. Why don't you struggle with it when you're with your elders? Why don't you struggle with that when you're with your pastors? Because you're a sheep. And there's strength in numbers. Glory to God. I need somebody in here, and I don't know who this is for. Catch back up. Stop straggling behind. You fighting with stuff you wouldn't have to fight with if you was with everybody else. Glory to God. Amen. Exodus 33, verse number 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give it. And I will send my angel. This, this scripture blows my mind. And I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite and the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. Verse number four. And when the people heard this bad news, they mourned and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, say to the children of Israel, you are a stiff-necked people. I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. In other words, you are not anything that I've called you to be. Everything that I've called you to be is what I want to burn up. I want to be in your midst, but I'm a consuming fire and you're flammable. You, you, you built your faith off of flimsy stuff. That if me and you hang out, it ain't going to be none of you left. By the time you get home, you're going to go up and smoke. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I want to hang out with you. But when I told you to be holy like me, you didn't embrace holiness. And holiness lights up everything that's not holy. And you too unholy for me to go with you. I'll kill you before you get there. Not intentionally. Amen. For the Lord... And when the people heard this, I'm going for bad news, they mourn and no one put on his ornaments. Verse five, for the Lord has said to Moses, say to the children of Israel, you are a stiff necked people. I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. Now, therefore, take off your ornaments that I may know what to do to you. That's a whole nother word. Why he had to make them take off the ornaments. So the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horab. Verse seven, Moses took his tent. And pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of meeting or the tent of meeting. Everybody say tent of meeting. That's been popping up a lot in my studies lately. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. So it was whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle that all the people rose and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of the cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. Glory to God. 
all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door and all the people rose and worshiped each man in his tent door. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, whoo, the one who got to cross over the son of Nun. A young man, I wonder why he's the one who said, I'll be with you like I was with Moses. Maybe because Joshua learned how to be with God like Moses learned how to be with God. Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Father, we thank you. And we bless you right now for the word that's quick. Powerful. Hairline sharp. Come in and divide us from everything that we've come into agreement with that's parading as if it's you. Break allegiance with everything that actually has uh, the desire to attack us. Lord God, wake us up. Shake our beds. Bring us into kingdom consciousness. Thank you for awakening on this afternoon. And we'll bless you and thank you for it right now. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Come on, all God's people said amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now watch this, and it's so, so powerful. Because I need you now to understand how we are to view the book of Exodus in relation to us today. Amen. It's not a story we read about what they did. It's a story that applies to how we are to shift ourselves. It completely applies to us today. It is not an Old Testament story. It is spiritual patterns. It, they're, 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 they're spiritual and divine patterns that, ne that, that go from generation to generation. Amen. When examining the book of Exodus, we must recognize that Israel, who we know um, it's basic knowledge we learned in Sunday school, wanders through the wilderness for 40 years, never, and I repeat, never besides two of them, uh, and m many historians say more than 3 million left Egypt, at least 2.5 million, but m many, some say 3.1 million left Egypt. Of those in 40, they wandered through the, the wilderness for 40 years, never entering into Canaan. You know what that represents? Cause I, I don't have time to really beat around the bush. It represents the characteristics of a congregation that will never enter into the promises of God. How they followed God is the way that if we follow God like they did, we won't enter like they couldn't. The example of how they follow God to the degree our following of God reflects it helps us to understand we will not enter into the eternal intentions of God. It is the example of the believer that doesn't make it. Manna is for believers who don't make it. Water out of rocks is for believers that don't make it. Because water is supposed to be able to come from your belly. Amen. Amen. The law is for the believer that doesn't make it. By the law shall no man be justified. Living a life as a believer where you're constantly wondering. From place to place, God, I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know when you're going to come through. God, when is it going to happen? When is it going to stop? When are you going to open this? When are you, what, what does it sound like? When are we going to be able to eat something besides this manna? When are we going to actually enter into the promised land? How long are we going to have to walk through this wilderness? How long? It is the example of following God in a way of an individual that has already forfeited their right to ever enter into the kingdom of God. That is not the reflection of men and women of God who actually enter into the promise. I need y'all to understand that right up front. Amen. Everybody's still with me. I believe that the scripture actually backs up what I just said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And I'm going to read verse number 10. If y'all don't mind what I, uh, uh, that I teach for a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 10, 11 in the Passion Translation. Right? In the Passion Translation. And we must not, this is now Paul talking to the church of Corinth. 
about the Israelites in the wilderness and how that implies to their faith, New Testament faith. How that applies to their New Testament faith. It's not Old Testament. Amen? It says, and we must not embrace their ways by complaining, grumbling with discontent, as many of them did and were killed by the destroyer. Verse number 11. All the tests they endured on their way through the wilderness are a symbolic picture, an example that provides us with a warning so that we can learn through what they experienced. For we live in a time when the purpose of all the ages past is now completing its goal within us. God is saying we're not called to ask to do what they did. We're called to finish what they did. We're actually asking God, let us do what they did on Pentecost. We're at the end of the age. We're supposed to be in position to finish it. Let me tell you, neighbor, we're called to finish the job. Notice the warning. We're not called to go back to the good old days. We're called to be the culmination. Come on, the silhouette, the, 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 the apex. Notice his language in 1 Corinthians 10. And we must, we must not embrace their ways. Notice that phrase. That was in verse 10. For it is an example that provides us with a warning so that we can learn through what they experience. If we follow the way we follow, we won't enter the way they couldn't enter. They had a promised land. Glory be to God, we have a promised spirit and a promised liberty and a promised peace and a promised authority to make disciples of nations and a, and a promised spirit life of life and peace. And so we got to understand we can read about it, but that don't mean we'll experience it. You can read about it all day and you can quote it and actually quote it good, but that doesn't mean you entered into that. And so you have whole congregations that can quote 90% of the book, but have not experienced 5% of it. Amen? Why? Why is that? Because I don't believe we have now followed Paul's admonition to look at their example and make sure that we pull our tendencies to follow God that look like theirs back into their proper position. Somebody shout position. Amen? So, so, so watch this. Exodus 33. I'm going to read that verse 1 through 3, and I'm just going to read it. King James Version. I'm going to deal with some some areas for which we have to make sure we're not following like they're following. You're a part of a flock. Don't forget that. You're not an island off by yourself. Amen. You can't just grow at your own pace. You're a part of a body. What if my head said, look, I grow at this pace. But then my foot say, no, -uh, I grow at this pace. So I got a 30-year-old man's foot with a five-year-old boy's head because we all grow at our own pace. It don't work like that. Stop believing that foolishness. Amen? Can you imagine somebody who had a five-year-old head on a 30-year-old body? Like, why are you looking at me funny? I have a right to grow at my own pace. It's foolishness when we actually realize what we're called to. I just don't grow like everybody else. Man, I need a new hand then. If you ain't going to grow like everybody else, I need another hand. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just wanted to entertain that thought process for a minute. <laughs> All right. Exodus 33, verse number one. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. And the Lord said unto Moses, depart. 
and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, unto thy seed will I give it. Verse 2, and I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Verse number two, he says, and I will send an angel before thee to drive out the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Amorite, the Hittite, and I'll let you, I'll drive them out unto the land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up with you in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume you in the way. The first characteristic of a congregation that won't ever enter into the promise of God um, is the congregation that trades in the presence of God for angelic escorts. I love angels, but I got a problem with you talking more to angels than you do Jesus. I got a problem with you studying angels more than you study the Christ. Because you ain't called to be in the image of no angel. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm going to take it a step further, but I'm going to stop right there. You, one, you wonder why angels have gotten so popular in this time? It's because we don't know how much we're starting to look like, like rejected Israel. Amen? Amen. But I'm going to take it another way. Literally, the people who are rejected are fine obtaining things that God wants to give them by following angels instead of walking with God. What that scripture is saying is you don't have to walk with God to follow angels. Angel means messenger. Can I take it the way I want to take it? Angel means messenger. Let me bring it down a little bit. To the angel of the church of Laodicea. To the angel of the church of Ephesus to the angel of the church of Smyrna to the angel of the church of Pergamos. in other words I'm not just talking about angelic being but angels as messengers angels as preachers angels as congregational pastors there are people who would rather follow the pastor than they would walk with God Amen. Any congregation that trades in God's presence for angelic escort cannot enter in. Come on, angels. I'm talking about preachers. Escort congregations into levels of success. You know how they do it? By way of principles. Can I talk to you for a minute? Angels, now when you're following an angel instead of God, you will learn principles to get what God wants to give you. The five keys to be encouraged. The 10 steps to remain motivated. The seven steps to peace. Why is that a problem? Because if I have to learn the seven steps of peace, it's proof I'm not walking with the prince of peace. Why in the world would I try to implement seven steps to get what I could have if I just walk with the one who has peace in who he is? The principle is proof I'm not walking in his presence. But I want an angel to escort me because I am not walking with God, but I still want what God has for me. What do you need seven principles for peace when the prince of peace says I'll never leave you nor forsake you? Why would I want to implement principles when I can live off of the aura of the presence? Hello? Three steps to breakthrough. That's a, why is that a problem? Because that means I'm not walking with the presence of the breaker. I wonder if there's anybody that read the prophet Micah 2 and 13. And the breaker will go before you and he will break and, and things will be broken up. He'll, he'll rub a shandy a tanya. To, I need a breakthrough. No, you need to, me and you need to learn how to walk with the breaker. And when breakthrough is necessary, it'll happen without us struggling because breakthrough is at our disposal because the breaker. 
Where's my breakthrough? Riding with me. We're trading in presence for principles because we're not willing to yield and sacrifice to the degree to walk in his presence. We're not willing to give up the wood, hay, and stubble that we know he's going to burn. Amen? So, the re- you know why the reason why so many saints need counseling? Because they don't walk with the counselor. Why would I pay a man to give me a lesser degree of counseling than the counselor who is not going to tell me just have joy but actually in saying it to me is going to impart it into me why am I going to get information when I could get impartation impartation is I'm part I'm part I'm part he said my peace I give to you I'm not telling you to have peace I'm giving you my peace why would I trade in counseling on your couch when I could have the counselor in my heart we're paying money we should be giving to God the people who can't counsel us like God somebody shout he's the counselor glory be to God get in his prayer I just can't figure it out well if any man lack wisdom Let him ask of God who gives unto every man liberally. But let him ask not doubting because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's tossed to and fro. That man shall expect to not to receive anything from the Lord. If me and you ask for help from God and we did not receive it, that means when we asked, we didn't believe he was actually going to do it. Amen. I love it what he says. The Bible says he helps us right early. That's one of my favorite scriptures. I'm like, man, what kind of, what kind of subject verb agreement is that? What, time, what kind of phonics? I mean, uh, uh, he helps us. Anybody read that scripture? He helps us write early. Write er- See, early is before time. Uh, uh, write early is long before I ever needed help. He gave me what I needed through being the helper in me to face what I'm facing. If I now am facing a problem, I know my help was right early. I probably got what I needed for this last year. I probably got what I needed for this two years ago I probably got what I needed for this three months ago because he never helps us on time he may not come when you wanna but he'll always be on time nope he doesn't come on time he comes before you get in time and he says I'm the lamb slain before time I am the God that goes to the end and I finish it before I get back on the other side of time and I start it no if you're facing it in time he handled it before the clock started ticking I need somebody to shout he already handled this Man, that stuff make me want to poke my chest out feel like a cowboy up in here somebody about to get it he already handled this What you looking at? Somebody shout right early. Glory to God. What we must understand, people of God, is peace is based off of principles. Peace, excuse me, peace isn't based off of principles. Peace is based off of proximity. My assignment isn't to teach you the principles of peace. It's to teach you to host the presence of the Prince of Peace. So when you get, you'll you'll get too close to him not to have peace. I'm too close not to have peace. I'm I'm too near not to have peace. A lack of peace has nothing to do with what you're facing and a lack of proximity to God. I guarantee you're not seeking God. And if you are, you're just trying to find scriptures to encourage me. Send me 10 scriptures to encourage me. You're not seeking God. You're trying to fix yourself. That's not what seeking God is. Seek God because he knows what you need before you ask. So why am I going to bring that up? Why not just seek him? Watch this. 
And so Jesus in nev never intended for us to learn the principles of breakthrough, but how to walk with the breaker, but how to walk with the breaker. So now when breakthrough is necessary, amen, breakthrough happens without stress, without strain, without worry. And I get that right. What? It's like, man, people looking around say, what are we going to do? Oh, we got a breakthrough. How you know? Because if we got a problem, the breakthrough was right early. It's already here. Ain't that a good way to live? I think that what God has given us is much better than what we've given him credit for. I think the blood is better than what we've given it credit for. I think that the lifestyle of the believer, the reason why people don't want to come to church is because we're struggling like them. Because we haven't made it look good the way it looks good. The anointing looks good. When, when you see the anointing on somebody, you can't take your eyes off. It's just something about you. What's that in your voice? What'd you do to your hair? The same thing you did. What's the difference? The glory. What type of tie is that? Where you get it from? It's the same tie you got. What's the difference? The glory. Amen. It's attractive. Christian lifestyle is supposed to be attractive. It's supposed to be attractive. You know why? Because Jesus is the desire of the nations. And he never leaves us. I have what every nation desires walking with me on a personal level wherever I go. Amen? It draws people. But it's not principles, it's presence. We're not called to implement principles, but to walk in his presence where everything we need is at our disposal. Glory be to God. I need joy. Well, guess what? I ain't got to. It's at my disposal. I don't know what you need right now. You might need peace, but it's at your disposal. You glory be to God. You, 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 you might need a lifting in your spirit. It's at your disposal. I need boldness. Because I'm ready to step up in the, in the arena of witness. It's at your disposal. Amen? As we host the presence of God. But this is the danger. And this is why so many people fall in the trap. And this is why principles have gotten so much more of a bigger deal than presence. And this is why we made presence only, hosting presence only about listening to music. And only about singing and crying during worship songs. The reason why we made it about that, when worship singing, which I love to do, is a very small part of worship. It's a very small, it's an important part of worship. But the greatest part of worship is actually obedience. Amen? But in all honesty, not praising, praising God is being obedient. Lifting your hands is being obedient. He said, bless the Lord, O you people. He didn't say, would you bless me? He said, make a joyful noise. He did not say, would you make a joyful noise? Those are not suggestions or requests. When I praise God, I'm being just as obedient as when I don't sin. Amen? So, so, so we need to know that. Uh, you know the danger in implementing principles to accomplish something instead of being developed in stewardship or in stewarding his presence, we can actually get the result of God without God being there. I'm going to say that again because it's so dangerous. I so fear that. We can actually get what God wants to give us and he not be there when we get it. He tells Israel, I'm going to give you an angelic escort. And you going to get the land flowing with milk and honey. But I won't be there when you come. I won't be there when you get it. You'll get what I said, but I won't be. I so fear that, that when I get it, he won't be there. Do you understand that? When I get what I'm supposed to get from God without God, do you understand how devastating that is? Then what I get from God, you know what it won't do? It won't change the world around me. 
because God ain't there when I got it. He didn't just give it to me to give it to me. He gave it to me to change the world around me. When we get what we're supposed to get from God with God present, then what we get causes people to get saved. What we accomplish draws individual to the king. See, our problem is we get a personal breakthrough and guess who's the, who's the only one that knows us? Because God wasn't there when we got it. We just used three keys to get breakthrough. But when I get a breakthrough from God, God starts waking me up two hours early and I ain't sleepy. And he starts asking, who shall go for us? And I say, send me. Your, your prayer life shifts when God is there. Uh, uh, something about your witness shifts when God is there. You don't just get it without him. Something happens to you where you begin to impact the world around you in a way you weren't impacting. I got a breakthrough. Who's the only one that knows? You're the only one that knows. Nobody's getting saved because of that breakthrough. Nobody's coming out of bondage because of that breakthrough. Nobody's even being prayed for because of that breakthrough. What's the point of that breakthrough? He wasn't there when it happened. You don't need God to come out of something. Y'all know that, right? There are plenty of people who stop doing drugs and they don't get saved. You don't have to get saved to stop doing drugs. Amen? You can use principles. What happens to us doesn't affect anything around us when we get it without God when we get the job and God isn't there the only one only people that notice is the people when we put the picture on Facebook and say I got a new job if we didn't put it on Facebook wouldn't nobody even know because we got it but God wasn't there amen it's devastating I don't want to get nothing and God ain't there but that means what happens for me ain't going to change nothing around me. That's scary. I'm getting fat, but ain't nobody changing. So what God has for us produces nothing that God wants for the world around us. He said, I'm going to give it to you, but I ain't showing up. Because God expected them to take the promised land to change the world. Y'all know they were supposed to change the world to Palestine? He said, when you get there, you tear down every altar. You rip up every grove. You burn down every form of worship. You, in other words, I'm going to empower you to literally revise the entire way the world walks with God. I'm sending you in there to turn the world upside down. But since you want an angel instead of me, you go, but I ain't going with you. And what happened? There was altars that never got torn down. What happened? There were groves and high places that now followed and decimated and, and desecrated the people of God throughout their time there they never cleared out the land because they got it without God being there they never did you ever tell your neighbor I'm, I can change the world with God with God amen and so watch what it go, goes on to say here and I'm not going to be long Exodus 33 and 16, it says, uh, For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated. Everybody say separated. separated. Distinguished. I and thy people from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Let me help us. Can we understand something right now? It's not our sermons that distinguish us. It's not our mission that everybody wants to change the world. Everybody wants to help hurting kids. Everybody wants to help the abused. That does not separate us from anybody else. Amen. It's not our music that distinguishes us. It's not that we come to church on Sunday morning. That distinguishes us. The only reality 
that can make us any different than anybody else is the presence of God on us. You can go to any church and get a good fundamental sermon. Amen? That don't mean anybody going to get their life changed. Because it must be presence. That's the only thing. When I go to work, it must be presence. When I preach, it must be presence. When I pray, it must be presence. I know it's not about feeling God, but I refuse to go after God and not feel it. I refuse to praise during praise and worship and not feel it. I refuse to thank him in my car and not feel it. Because if I feel it, that means his presence is on me. That's the only thing that's going to make me different than anybody else. Everybody's saying come to Jesus. But there has to be somebody with enough God on them where people actually really come. Everybody's saying walk away from sin. But there has to be somebody with enough of God's presence on them. Where they actually feel enough of the conviction of the Holy Spirit that convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. They feel enough of the spirit of that word on that man or woman's mouth. But there's actually conviction. It's the presence. And, and my thing is, it's like I'm giving the truth. That don't mean anybody going to change. No matter how much truth you get, where's the presence? Amen? He didn't just say truth, he said spirit. And I'm giving him the truth, but where's the spirit? Wind should be coming off of our words. Wind should be coming off of our worship. Wind should be coming off of our thank you. Wind should be coming off of us in our workplace. That's the only thing that makes us different. God says, I'll give you success, but I ain't going. Moses understood right away that ain't going to work. Moses said, "Uh uh-uh. My God, I wish we had some men and women of God that would understand. That would rise up like Moses and say, nah, success ain't enough. I can't just teach these folks how to be successful and they actually be any separate than anybody else. I can't do that. I, I, there's something more than that. God, if you don't go with us, we'll be just like everybody else. The problem is the church has bit the lie. The lie that some high level of success will separate us from everybody else and make us want to come. If they see us successful enough. They'll want to come to the Jesus that we come to. If they see that, that is a lie from the pits of hell. Success does not separate us. It don't matter how many businesses you start. There's somebody who could care less about God that got more businesses. It don't matter how much money you got. There's somebody who says there is no God that got more money. Amen. In that case, the one with the biggest wallet. Amen? And what it's done is it's caused us, y'all don't mind if I just talk for a minute, do you? It's caused us to settle for unsanctified success. There's too many saints embracing unsanctified. Sanctified is something that's distinguishable. Something that ain't like everything else unsanctified success is success you could have if you weren't saved or walking with God listen we can get a promotion on our job without walking with God I thank God for your promotion I know all good things come from God but in all actuality you ain't got to show up for church every week to get that we can start our own business without knowing God that's still unsanctified success This one is a big one. We can raise our children to go to college. That still doesn't mean we are walking with God. There are people who are not walking with God doing it. And I thank God my child is is going to college. But I understand that doesn't mean I have done my job as dad. I haven't been successful 
until he, I, uh, 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 until God shows up in Jeremiah Mir Jr.'s life and says, I am the God of your fathers. I am the God of Jeremiah Sr. I am, oh, glory be to God. It's not until he shows up in his room like he showed up in my room and said, from here on out, you won't be what you were. I'm snatching you out of everything. I'm pulling you out of this world and I'm going to make you a wrecking ball in this world. It's not until I see my boy lay hands like I did. It's not until I see my boy cast out devils like I did. It's not until I see my boy lay it all down for God. I thank God for the cap, but I want to see the crown on him. My job isn't done. That's unsanctified success. But after four generations, when my son is a prophet and an apostle, and his son whew, isn't a prophet and an apostle, and his son's son is an apostle and a prophet and an evangelist and a teacher, and his son's son, son's son, son, son is the one like John who makes a way in the river and says he's coming. I have not been successful until I have somebody in my lineage that's saying come Lord Jesus when he comes. When he cracks the sky I got a boy that's standing on the ground of God saying come Lord Jesus. Then I've done my job. It has to be a voice out of the mirrored line. Hold up. I'm not settling for unsanctified success. I want stuff where people don't realize what I did until I was dead. You have to look back at what I did after I was dead to actually figure out how much God was doing. Through my life. Amen. Unsanctified success can't satisfy us. Come on. Amen. We must come out of being satisfied with unsanctified success or success that doesn't separate us from anyone else and begin again to run after the only thing that can, the presence of God. The first characteristic of a congregation that will not enter into the eternal intention of God, which I am terrified of. The first characteristic of a congregation that will not enter into the eternal intention of God is that they've traded in the presence of God for an angelic escort. Principles of the Bible versus the person who the principles actually represent. Number two. Exodus 33, verse 7 and 8. Y'all don't mind if I teach for a minute, do you? God, I feel the presence of God. There's a holy stillness, man. Woo! Glory to God. Glory to God. There's legacy grace in here. I just need you, if you got children in this room, lay your hands on them right now. Father God, come on, there's legacy grace in this room. Wherever your children are, come on, we need, I feel it. Come on, there's legacy. Father God, right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we thank you that this is unto our children and our children's children, that the shift that you're bringing us into right now, they'll live the entirety of their life. They'll never be satisfied with success. They'll be those who restore the ancient ways, the generation that rebuilds the desolations of many generations. I bless you right now that you position them to mark them. In the name, dreams break out. Visions break out. Encounters break out. Unctions to lay hands on the sick break out. 
pull into prayer break out in our children right now I need somebody that believes that to bless it come on bless God right here and right now we won't be satisfied don't try to sell us on success Satan we're going to see our children rise up now watch this Watch this. Exodus 33, verse 7 and 8. And Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp. Everybody say outside the camp. Outside the, camp. the camp, but that's good. Outside the camp. Far from the camp. Everybody say far from the camp. From the camp. And called it the tabernacle of meeting. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. The tent of meeting. Did y'all get that? I mean, that should have slapped you as soon as you read it. The tent of meeting, the place where the congregation sought God, was far away from where they laid their head. Where they worship was completely separated from how they lived. The tent of meeting was far from the camp. The way they worship didn't reflect the way they camped. So they would actually go to the tent of meeting, excuse me, go to church on Sunday to do what they didn't do all week. It sounds a lot. Oh yeah. They would go on to the tent of meeting far away from how they live Monday through Saturday. They would come to church on Sunday and sing praise songs that they didn't sing at home. They would come to church on Sunday and read a Bible they didn't read at home. They would come to church on Sunday and say, God, give me your will that they didn't ask for at home. Their place of meeting God God was far from how they actually lived. It looks a lot like us today, don't it? One of the sure signs that a congregation of people will not enter into Yahweh's eternal purposes is when the way they look at church, they look nothing like at home. Whew, hear me. Because he said these things are given for our warning so we can pull ourselves back in the right position. In the church, there's praise and prayer. At home, there is devices and Netflix. In the church, there's seeking God. At home, there is no seeking God. Amen? And we're wondering why. Why is other people getting stuff I'm not getting? Because you can't live like that and enter in. That is the reflection of the follower who has forfeited their ability to ever enter into the kingdom of God. But can I tell you good news? The good news is Yahweh is releasing grace for us to bring the tent of meeting back into the camp. Come on, the tent is coming back home. God is bringing us to the place where we'll be able to, we won't be able to tell the camp from the tent. My God, I don't know if they in church or at home. I don't know if they at home or if they at church because what they do at church, they do at home. And what they do at home, they do at church. They dance at church and they dance in their living room. They shout at church and they shout in their kitchen they have prayer at church and they call neighborhood prayer at home the tent is coming back home to the camp come on that's the good news about it it's a tent it's not a building you can move it look at your neighbor tell your neighbor you can move it the presence that you have in here right now, you can move it. The glory that's in this place right now, you can move it. The truth that's sitting in this house, it's a tent. You can move it. Look at somebody tell your neighbor, the tent is coming to the camp. <laughs> to the degree our camp looks nothing like our tent. To that measure, we're following God in a way when we will not enter into the fullness of his eternal purposes. He said these things were written for our example for which the end of the age would come. Last thing, because everybody shout position. position. Just want to get us in position. Exodus 33, verse 8 through 10. 
Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Reba Shandaraka. There's a holy stirring in the room. There's a saturation of holiness. There's a, there, God is tugging somebody back, waking you up right now, saying, get back up. Come on. Get back in the fight. Get back in the fire. Snap out of it. Exodus 33, verse 8 through 10. I know, man, a lot of people got a bucket list. I got a healing list. Before I leave here, I need to heal cancer, AIDS, schizophrenia, dementia, multiple sclerosis. And I need to see some eyes and ears grow back. I got a healing list. I don't know about you. I know some places people want to go, but it's some things I need to see. Exodus 33, verse number 8. <clears throat> and it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle. I'm almost done, y'all. That all the people rose up and stood, every man at his tent door, and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. Verse 10. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. Do y'all see that? They saw how Moses engaged God's presence and used that as the grounds for their worship. I'm trying to help you understand the type of worship that will, you will not enter in. The worship system of those who will not enter in was based on the congregation watching another man sacrifice what was necessary to enter into the presence of God and hear his voice. And they were relying on another man's encounter as the basis of their worship. They would watch what he did and worship God for it. They would listen to what God gave him and worship God for it. In other words, they would stay in the camp while he went to the tent. Y'all ain't hear what I'm saying. So I'm going to let you lay down your life while I still live mine. And so now, now glory be to God. I'm going to let you die to yourself while I still suck up mine. I'm going to let you lay it all down for the kingdom. I'll let you do what's necessary to hear them. I'm going to hang out in the camp and watch TV. I'm going to hang out at the camp and pop popcorn. I'm going to hang up at the camp and I'm going to the movies on Saturday. Moses, you come to the church and pray for three hours. We're going to the movies. It is the characteristics of a congregation that will not enter you, you cannot rely on another man's cross. You cannot rely on another man's cross to bring you into places of passion you should have provoked your own self into. And so they said, you go to the tent, we staying home. You come here and sacrifice, you live stream, we ain't even coming to church. We can live stream it so when we don't want to pay attention, we ain't got to hide it. We getting, we getting, we popping popcorn, we watching movies. We clicking on, turning it all the way down so they can see our name pop up. I know I'm in there because that's what car carnal, th that's just, I'm not that prophetic. That's just how carnality is. It's very predictable. Amen. But it's the characteristic of a congregation that will not, 
Man, if one man's commitment to God could save three million people, what if a whole congregation commits the same way? can chase a thousand but my God we get to 10,000 we get 350,000 we get 400,000 what happens when a people actually say yes to be in a holy nation a royal priesthood able to offer spiritual sacrifice what happens when we all lay it down what happens when everybody's tent looks like their camp and everybody's camp looks like their tent the world gets changed We actually can change the world. I wasn't born to babysit believers. I wasn't born to impress you on Sunday after you ignored God all week. Jump through hoops. The spirit was moving and all you really want me to do is preach in an anointing that gets you excited so you can go back to business that has nothing to do with his. So I'm getting to the point where people say I'm mad and I'm saying, so what? You don't want what we're trying to get anyway. Y'all know I love, man. I don't know what to say here. I don't know what else to say from that, Minister Trace. I don't even know how else to put that. I don't know how clear that could be. Pastor, I don't know what to do. I come to the conclusion that it doesn't matter how many times you feel better until you change what you're focused on, until you break out of this wilderness worship mindset until you break out of this pastoral model all you're going to do is feel better today and be mad again next month and I am tired of making formula for you we got somewhere we got to go I got to see the glory we got to change the world Florence should not, will never be the same I'm not dying in Florence be like it was before I got there I'm not dying in Hartsfield be like we gotta get Akalu I love you but I ain't come here for us to have good church services and to get you excited something should change because of what you heard this morning and if don't nothing change after what you heard tonight, then it was a waste. It's a waste. People think I love preaching. I don't. You love to preach, don't you? No, but I have life to do it. How dare I despise the grace of God? It's just the grace of God flowing in me. Woe it be unto me if I don't preach the gospel. Konana. Kondaya. Everybody's standing to your feet. Konana. Y'all feel the presence of God? Marcus, if you